Good morning to those of you who are in the Central Time Zone and West Coast, and good afternoon for those of you on the East Coast. Welcome to Fraud Education's free webinar on college admissions during COVID-19 uh, for the Northeast region specifically, and how uh, COVID-19 has disrupted college admissions and standardized testing for your region at all. So my name is Ibrahim Fraud, and I am the Chief Educational Consultant for Fraud Education. And I'm joined by my colleague in the Boston area, Kevin March, who is our college admissions consultant. Thanks for joining us today, Kevin. A uh, little bit about uh, myself. Uh, I've been in educational consulting for 15 years and 12 years with Fraud Education. I've started out as a SAT and ACT tutor, um, clocked in over 10,000 hours of tutoring for the SAT and ACT, and then moved on to college admissions consulting and clocked in over 14,000 hours of that. I've published over nine books in school and college admissions, and my students have gotten into a thousand college acceptances and more, um, 38 of which were Ivy acceptances, those colleges that we are gonna be talking about today, uh, 14 international acceptances, and I have visit, visited over 280 colleges in the United States. My students have earned over $88 million in combined merit-based scholarships. And I've been a member of the National Association of College Admissions Counseling, which is NACAC, uh, the regional version, which is Texas TACAC, and the IECA, Independent Educational Consultants Association. I've been a professional member and a board member for. And I'll turn it over to Kevin, so he will introduce himself to us as well. Kevin? Hi, I'm Kevin March. Um, so I have about four years in educational consulting and test prep. I also started in test prep um, a few years ago and then kind of transitioned into that college consulting role. Um, I started with Virat in December, 2019, so I'm pretty new, uh, but I'm really excited to get started and really tackle this new and pretty challenging admission cycle. I have uh, over 2000 hours of college admissions consulting experience at this point, and then about 1500 hours of SAT and ACT tutoring. Um, I focus more on the, the SAT because I'm based in the Northeast, but I've done plenty of ACT as well. Uh, over 200 college acceptances, it's probably higher than that, but I went a little bit conservative. Um, 10 Ivy League acceptances, three international acceptances. Um, I've personally visited over 30 colleges um, and I'm uh, hoping to increase that number, you know, when the circumstances permit, but I, I really enjoy visiting. Um, and then I have about at least a million raised in total merit-based scholarships. So that's pretty exciting as well. Otherwise, I'm um, a member of the IECA I, I joined recently, and then um, also NACAC, so. Awesome, thanks for joining me today, Kevin. And a little bit about fraud education. We were founded in 2008 in Houston, Texas. Uh, since then, we have um, served over a thousand students with now 11 consultants, such as Kevin himself. Um, we are in nine different cities, um, two office locations in the Houston area. And our students um, on average have improved their ACT scores by nine points from baseline to uh, final and then uh, 390 points for the SAT from baseline to final. And 98% of our students have been admitted into at least one of their top two choices. Today's discussion is going to be about strategies and typical timelines for college admissions and standardized testing pre-COVID-19 times. We start with this simply because we know after um, today, we uh, or after COVID-19, it's still going to be as um, as prevalent to go back to these typical strategies. And then we're gonna look at how has COVID-19 disrupted the regular flow in admissions and testing and what should be your strategy now. And at the end, we're gonna get to your questions um, using the Q&A feature of Zoom. So if you have any burning questions while we're talking, please feel free to go back to Zoom enter your questions on the Q&A section and submit it to us. Uh, we will leave enough time at the end of our conversation where we get to your questions personally and answer them live. So top factors for college admissions is what we start with every one of our webinars because these factors, these seven factors do not change. So I'll walk you through the gen general uh, picture about the top factors and Kevin is gonna talk to us about some of the details of each of the factors. So 
number one factor for college admissions have been GPA and or rank from the high school that you come from. Um, the second factor is the curriculum rigor, like how many APs, how many honors, advanced and uh, IB high level classes have you taken? SAT, ACT scores as the number three factor. College essays, so the essays that you apply to college with. Relevant activities in leadership, which is essentially the student's resume in and outside of school activities that relate to their college major or career path and their leadership opportunities. Strong recommendation letters from teachers and counselors for the college admissions process. And finally, the family's ability to pay. So I'll go back to Kevin to kind of walk us through why these seven factors and how can students improve their chances of getting into a college using these seven factors? Yeah, and so I, I'd really want to especially focus on sort of the, the, the activities, the essay, and then the rec letters. Um, the activities and leadership, I think, are sort of, they really should be kind of directed by the student and like based on their interests rather than kind of being a, ja a jack of all trades. You want to focus on I think the phrase is like a foot wide, a mile deep. You really want to kind of build that sort of profile where you show, demonstrate interest in like a few things versus kind of being like on the football team a little bit, you know, on the soccer team or baseball team a little bit, you know, an extra in one of the plays. Like you really want to show that you're focused on something that you're, or a few things that you're really passionate about. Um, the essay should be really self-reflective and then for the ones that are like, especially the common app, um, you really want to be thoughtful and try to show a piece of yourself to the college admissions officers. And then with the the school specific supplement essays, you really want to show up like a demonstrated connection to the school and show that you've really done your homework. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit, but this is a really good time to do that homework on colleges and figure out like what special programs, what you know what what things you're specifically interested in and how going to college x will like let you achieve your career goals um and then strong rec letters are another thing um and in some cases the, the rec letters aren't as important but i think in this case because um the you know because of the circumstances that we'll talk about the rec letters will actually become more important and especially at liberal arts colleges and there are a lot of like Kind of small elite liberal arts colleges in the northeast those will be really really good um, and something that you can control as well um, to try to get really good rec letters so i'll turn it back over to you yeah yeah thank you and uh, you know it's interesting that kevin has mentioned the three factors out of the seven that technically you guys can control over right in the application process right i mean relevant activities and leadership resume you know obviously that all starts in ninth grade uh, and the way you describe those activities and prioritize those activities in a resume could make or break your chances of admissions and the essay is obviously something you can control and the strong recommendation letters are something that you can control. So notice the controllable factors of top factors of admissions here. Obviously SAT and ACT you can control too with you know proper preparation, making sure you, you are on the right path with the right test, you can control that as well. But when it comes to GPA and or rank and you're a junior or a senior, I mean, it's very, very hard to move the needle when it comes to GPA and or rank or even the curriculum rigor. So therefore, there are factors that you can control now and there are controls that you can look back and you know, really appreciate or regret. So, but regretting is not gonna solve the problem. So what's gonna solve the problem is focusing on the other factors. The one factor that we haven't talked is the ability to pay. This is a relatively new factor um, in the college admissions cycle, given the financial nature of uh, financial aid, you know, uh, needs-based financial aid. Colleges have started to ask the question whether the student or the family will need uh, needs-based financial aid in the application process. If you say yes to that question, obviously your application is gonna be viewed in context of the ability to pay. If you say no, then not. Having said that, would that increase or decrease your chances of admissions? That depends on the college because some colleges are 100% needs met. So in that case, really, it doesn't matter if you say yes or no to that question. But keep these seven factors in mind because that's how we're going to relate back to some of the disruptions and what you can do today with COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. 
I'd like to take a moment to talk about what our typical strategies are for ninth and 10th graders. And Kevin is gonna take the 11th and 12th graders. Uh, Pre-COVID-19 times, we ask our ninth graders to focus on their academics more important than ever. They have to start on the, on the right foot with at least a 3.9 or higher unweighted GPA or equivalent. Um, and doing so, they're gonna have to take as many honors in AP and advanced courses as possible as long as they can maintain that high GPA. Um, we also ask them to test out of intro level math and foreign language courses so they end up being in the advanced path when it comes to these subjects, if they need to in the future. For standardized testing, we don't really ask any ninth graders to take the SAT or the ACT. They can take the SAT subject tests, which are very similar to the AP tests that they would take uh, for any of their AP classes. Um, and there's nothing to lose by taking these SAT subject tests. You can decide to submit the scores if you do well. If you don't do too well, then you don't have to. And on the college admissions side, we recommend ninth graders to start kind of doing the online research, finding out what colleges are about, and maybe even visit some of the nearby colleges, especially for our Northeast viewers. You have so many colleges in a square mile that you can tend to visit a college just by walking down the street. So start with that as a ninth grader and really make a difference and get that inspiration going. For 10th graders, we continue to advise on the as many honors, APs, advanced courses as possible. But again, they need to maintain that high GPA. For standardized testing, this is when we start to identify which of the two tests, SAT or the ACT, is the better test for the student. Um, so the best time to do this is really the middle of 10th grade. So if the student is just past the um, Christmas break for their school in 10th grade, it is a good time to look back and take two practice tests, one SAT, one ACT, compare the two scores, identify which test is better, and go with that test um, to prep for while either individually or via tutoring uh, starting in the summer between sophomore year and junior year. They can also continue to take the SAT subject tests uh, for the subjects that they're expert or better in. For college admissions, we ask 10th graders to begin identifying their path. More and more students in 10th grade typically say, I don't really know what I want to do with my life. That's okay. I mean, you're 15, 16 years old. It's hard to know what you want to do in your life, but you can know what you're good at when it comes to subjects. So if you are an ELA, English language arts student, you know that already. If you're a social science person, I know Kevin and I were, you know, both history people, right? We, I knew I was a history person when I was sixth grade. So I, I mean, by 10th grade, I knew for sure. So identify which path you're on as early as uh, the first semester of 10th grade and actually start focusing on the, on the classes that you can take in advanced path for that area. And then of course, start you know, deeper research into colleges, research more, visit more, and start making a list and then start working that list um, more effectively on the 11th grade, which Kevin is gonna to talk to us next about. Yeah, um, so I think the first thing, and I think Ibrahim hit a lot of really good points there. The first thing I would say is try to really focus on your target area uh, in terms of your preferred subjects and really you know, take the best, hardest classes that you can. Um, for me personally, when I was in 11th grade, I was, as Ibrahim mentioned, I, I love history. I'm actually a, a PhD student in history now, but I, I knew that I loved it when I was 16 or 17. I didn't know what I was gonna do for my career, but I, I knew that I loved history. So I took AP Euro, AP US, um, like microeconomics kind of adjacent. Um, a, like I took government on my own and studied that for US government. Um, so I think that like, I knew that I wasn't, super strong at math or super strong at science. Um, so I, I really kind of carved a lane for myself in that way. Um, you definitely want to maintain your GPA, um, especially if you did well at the beginning. Um, that's great, but it kind of puts pressure on you to like not dip too much, especially as you get into harder classes. You don't, you don't want to tank kind of your 11th as an 11th grader. Um, and then really think about the GPA also for like your target colleges. So if you if you have a list or a preliminary list, you want to show that you're above that like 
kind of the middle of the middle 50%, if that makes sense. So kind of an example would be if the, we know the 50%, uh, the middle 50% of the GPAs is like 3.2 to 3.6. You, you definitely want to be at least a 3.4 at that point um, and really try to show that you're kind of in that upper middle range of GPA. Um, for standardized testing, normally this is the time to really kick it into high gear with the SAT and ACT. Um, hopefully you've identified which one you want to take at that point and are really going for that. Um, again, you want to kind of like aim for that upper middle 50%. Um, so, you know, if the SAT range is 26 to 30, you want to aim for like a 28 plus at a given college or university. And obviously you want to look at multiple universities that you're interested in. So you, you're ensuring that you're meeting, you know, that that score for each of them. Um, and then again, like visiting college and confirming the fit is another thing that we would normally advise on. Um, and that's going to change, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, right. And then so for seniors, um, basically, again, the advice is to limit the honors AP advanced level classes in your target area. And then kind of like really maintain your fall semester GPA, especially at or above your cumulative GPA. So you want to show that upward progression for sure. Um, standardized testing, hopefully you're done with that. In a few cases, I've seen that like subject tests can be used to place students. So that might be a, a factor at a few places, but overall you should be pretty much done. Um, and then for the college admissions aspect, um, you want to apply, definitely apply to your favorite colleges. Um, or if you have an early decision option, really think about that and apply by November 1st, October 15th, whatever the deadline is. Um, and then normally the universal deadline is to attend uh, by May 1st of your senior year. That's also been affected in some cases. So we'll talk about that. Awesome. And to be honest, that's what's happening. So this has been uh, our advice for so long in uh, college admissions that we've been hit with these breaking news with COVID-19. BU, which is in the region that we're talking about, go and test optional, which is, you know, kind of sort of expected, but at the same time, you don't expect it from a college like BU to do this, even though it is temporary. So we'll talk about that. Davidson doing the same thing, redesigning the whole college admissions process is being talked about. Um, more and more colleges go and test optional. SAT, ACT tests are being canceled. University of California system going test optional, which is a big, big news. So what does this all mean uh, when it comes to college, academics, standardized testing, and college admissions? So that's what Kevin and I are going to conversate about today. So I'll ask Kevin a few questions, and then he'll ask me some questions as well, and then we'll go back to our presentation to kind of give you more specific information as to which colleges have actually reacted in what ways. So Kevin, my first question to you is about the academic disruptions that you have experienced in the Northeast region when it comes to school closures, as well as remote learning opportunities for any of high schoolers, really, you know, even if you're in ninth grade, you're going back to remote learning. And if you're 11th grade, you're kind of freaking out because it's the prime time for doing really well in school and then you're remote learning. So can you tell us a little bit about what's been happening and then what the students should do to take advantage of this situation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as Massachusetts residents probably know, but uh, our governor, Charlie Baker, recently put in two place um, basically a stay at home order and then all non-essential businesses are closed um, through, at this point it's like May 4th, but it's been extended. It was previously April 2nd, I believe, and then it got pushed back. So there's some hope and that includes schools being closed. So all non-essential workers are basically, all non-essential businesses are closed and everyone's encouraged to stay home. Um, so that's affected every, pretty much every, um, you know, secondary education institution has gone online um, for their classes and often over Zoom, over other things. Um, there hasn't been a statewide mandate to make classes pass fail, but I would imagine and from what I've seen, um, districts are kind of taking that on individually and deciding. And the same is true with private schools, like it's kind of up there, they want to go pass fail or assign grades. Um, so I really recommend that if you're currently a student, definitely check what your policy is with your current school um, and see what their plans are. Try to like stay posted with that. Um, I know that a lot of colleges, um, they're 
going past like they're giving students the option to go past fail until like April 30th or something. So they're, they're really trying to ease pressure there. Um, that's a little bit of a side note, but an interesting tidbit nonetheless. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what's going on. Uh, there's cautious optimism that schools will try to go back, will try to return May 4th. Um, so they haven't bagged the semester completely, but I think realistically, if I were to bet on it, I think they're probably not gonna go back, so. So um, you, you touched on a few really good points there in terms of, you know, what is to expect. Now, what can the students to, what can the students do to kind of improve their, I guess, focus, like make sure that this year finishes strong so their college admissions chances are not being disrupted too much? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's definitely a challenging situation and I think everybody recognizes that, but I think the important thing is to really stay uh, focused and just kind of consistent with your work. I think it's tempting to say like, because especially if you have fewer classes or you're not meeting as frequently, it's tempting to kind of slack off and leave all your work to a day like before your classes, if they meet once or twice a week. Um, I'd recommend trying to really regiment your time and think about working on it every day. And if you're gonna take a silver lining from this, I think it's kind of more collegiate in some ways. Um, obviously colleges normally meet, but a lot of classes only meet like twice a week anyway. Um, and there's a lot of more outside work. So that's something to think about that you're, you're obviously not getting a, a true college experience, but you're kind of, you might be getting a little bit of a taste of that, which is an interesting way to think about it. That makes sense. So and to tag along with that is the question about the kind of grading system that the schools are using. So I know that some schools have decided to keep the grading system, letter mm -hmm. grade or percentage, whatever they're using, while some schools have gone to pass fail. And especially if you are a, a junior who's, you know, looking to jump up your GPA, as we just suggested, I mean, if they go to pass fail, this is going to completely change it. Or even if you have a freshman who, you know, just started ninth grade, now their first grade in spring is going to show pass fail. Is this going to hurt their chances of getting into college, especially those competitive colleges in your region? That's an excellent question. Um, I think that the, the short answer is no, um, in a lot of ways, if you play it right. I think that basically, um, no college, and I, I was reading a little bit on MIT's admission website last night, but I think this is true across the board. Basically, the MIT admission website said that, like, students aren't going to be penalized for factors outside of your, their control. So if they, you know, if the college, if your school makes, like, the unilateral decision to go pass fail, um, students aren't going to be penalized because, you know, the school's administrators did that under very understandable circumstances. Um, I think this is where kind of going back to the seven factors in admission, I think this is where the the rec letters come become especially important. Um, and I think that like, if you play it right, kind of you can talk to your teacher and if you show a lot of engagement as classes transition online or have been online, um, showing that kind of level of engagement in the material, really focusing on finishing the year, you can kind of get, you can ask them to write really quality recommendation letters that might say something like, hey, you know, obviously it's going to show up as pass fail on the transcript, but, you know, this would have been an A or like the student really put in a ton of effort. So I think that like leveraging those recommendation letters and then also, as we'll talk about in a second, thinking about standardized testing where it's available is going to be pretty important. So it makes me think what you said about, you know, rec utilizing recommendation letters. Let's say that we have a student who, you know, has taken AP U.S. history as a junior, I mean, have a 95 GPA or average, and then, you know, this student's, you know, school just went pass fail. So obviously he's gonna get a P, right, pass, but then there will be another student who's also in the same class, maybe with an 80 GPA, you know, average, and that's also a pass. So how can, you know, those two students take advantage of this opportunity? Like, I'm not trying to put down the 80 student, right? They right. should also get their way in terms of, you know, how they can take advantage of this pass opportunity, but also the other student can, you know, increase his chances of showing, hey, look, I've done really well in this class, uh, but it just shows as a pass. Yeah, that's absolutely a great question. I think the, I think the rec letters come in to both situations, but in different ways. Um, I think that 
with the student who's like averaging an A, for example, that you can say, um, you know, you can have a teacher kind of corroborate in their rec letter, like this, hey, this student was like doing really great and continued to do great, um, really focused on the material. And then for the student that was trying to really trend upwards and like have that 80, but maybe wants to improve, if they, it's almost more important for them to get the rec letter because if they really commit and show that they're, you know, studying to the extent possible and like really trying to improve, um, you can actually have the, you can have the rec letter say something along the lines of like, hey, the student, like the past almost like masks their improvement up. Um, and like you can have a teacher, you can have the rec letter kind of talk about that um, and how the students improved. And like, even if there wasn't, you know, a quantitative, you know, quantitative like thing on their transcript, it's only a pass. You can say like, the teacher might say something along the lines of like, well, the student really like improved by like up to like a B or a B plus or something and really showed a lot more effort. So I'm, yeah, I think that would really be enlightening to a lot of college admissions people. Excellent, excellent advice, thank you. And um, I'll, I'll kind of talk about the, or ask about the standardized testing piece now. And I know that in Massachusetts, you have a test called MCAS, which yeah. uh, many students take as 10th graders to identify whether they're, you know, um, qualify for scholarships for college. So, uh, you know, how is this test being uh, impacted by this? And should our ninth graders be worried about it? How about our 10th graders? So what would your advice be? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think there are a lot of, there's still a lot of pending details. I think, I know that at least a portion of the MCAS was scheduled for March, um, and it may or may not have been fully completed by the time that the shutdowns occurred around March 15th, um, and the schools really went online. I'm not sure if there are any plans to put it online at this point, but it could, that could definitely be something that, you know, is looked into in the future. I think that it's one of those factors that is outside of the student's control at this point, um, but it could be, it could impact the fall depending on like if students come back in the fall or if and when um, they come back. So that's one thing. Um, there hasn't been a lot of press on it at this point, but I think that that's something that we'll continue to monitor because it is really important for especially the UMass Amherst system or the UMass system um, often awards scholarships based on that performance on the um, the MCAS. So. Excellent. Excellent advice. Thank you so much. And uh, something related to the MCAS is I think the, uh, you know, the changes that's been happening in the APs. Um, AP tests, those students who've been in AP classes, they're now told by the college board, guess what? We made your test, you know, open book, 45 minutes long at home online. <laughs> so this is obviously great news for a lot of them, but there is also growing anxiety by a lot of them about, whoa, is this gonna be easier, harder? Is it gonna really, you know, make me look better in terms of college admissions? And most importantly, how will the colleges take these AP tests? Are they still gonna give them credit for it in college? So what have you heard from your regional colleges? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think there are a couple, you know, there are a couple things to answer there. But I think the first thing is that um, the format is definitely different. And I would think about, I would definitely look on the, the college board's website because there are a lot of online lessons for each AP test now and kind of instructions about how it's going to be different. Um, I, I went to a webinar last, or I attended a webinar last night about with the, um, the director of the AP tests. Um, mm -hmm. And he was one of the panelists. And basically he said that um, it's gonna be 45 minutes open note um, as we know, but basically students aren't, it's gonna be long enough that students aren't gonna be able to finish it and that's intentional. So they'll still not be able to finish it, but get a five and have, and they, you could still get a five even without finishing the test. Um, and there are different questions to pick from. There are also gonna be a lot of security measures. Um, so it's important to remember that open note doesn't mean like, you know, go, getting on a chat board with your friends or like messaging people or talking to your parents or anything like that, um, it will be proctored. So something to think about, um, go ahead. So Nate, I was gonna ask you about the, the, the difficulty. I think uh, a lot of the students think that um, the, the test, test might be easier given the open book structure and so on. Do you believe that based on what you've heard? I think it'll be roughly the same difficulty. So I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that it would be easier. I would encourage students to start practicing that format, you know, to the extent they know about it and writing out. 
I know it's going to be mostly essay questions um, and writing out kind of the the DBQs or like really focusing on that um, to the extent possible because it can be yeah it's um, it's definitely a shorter time and that's kind of um, it's it doesn't it's not going to be easy to like look up information kind of in that 45 minute window if you're completely unprepared. So um, that brings me up to, to another question about APs. You know, uh, obviously not every AP test is created equal, right? Some of them are extremely difficult by nature. Some of yeah. them are easier. Do you think this format and timing is bringing them more to level in terms of all across the board subjects and so on? That's a great question. I think, I think it's possible that that could be the case. Uh, it depends on the exact format of each test, but I, I would still prepare, you know, as much as you can, especially for the harder tests and really not assume that it's going to be easier. Um, because, you know, if you're, if it is easier then you know, you'll be completely, you know, kind of conveniently surprised, but mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, you want to be fully prepared and making sure that you're, um, really doing it for the, you know, like getting the highest score that you can. That said, um, I've heard kind of repeatedly from college admissions officers that really the AP classes are much more important than your results on the test. So obviously you want to do really well on the test, especially for credit purposes, but in terms of like doing well on the exam, like it's possible to do, you know, especially if you have a full year AP class, like I used to, I had that in high school. I um, mean, you, you got like an A in the first, the first uh, semester and then a pass, for example, um, and then you get a three or four on the exam, that's not gonna tank you. It doesn't mean that you haven't learned anything, especially in light of these circumstances. Um, you are, So you, you wanna do as well as you can, but it's not the end of the world if it doesn't go okay. as well as it could have. Excellent. Excellent advice, thank you. And then I'm going to move quickly into SAT and ACT, given that uh, both SAT and ACT have canceled for the rest of spring 2020. Um, June tests are, as of today, still on, which yes. doesn't mean after today's call, <laughs> they're still on. Yeah. I mean, things change almost minute by minute. Um, so given that situation with the SAT and ACT cancellations, and given the competitive nature of the schools that you are surrounded by in the Northeast, do you see test optional movement growing further? Um, and if so, what does that mean for the students? Like, should they just forget about the SAT, ACT for those colleges? That's a great question. Um, I think that there might be kind of increased sympathy around the test. So like Harvard, for example, uh, I was looking on their admissions website and they released a statement that basically said like, we totally understand if you can only take the test once, you know, before, the you know the applications are due but i think especially um kind of the ivy league for example and some of these other top places are not going to waive the test requirements um, i think that's a pretty safe bet partially because they're in these consortiums or like groups of colleges like the ivy league and for example like cornell is not going to do it if unless harvard does it and dartmouth's not going to do it unless like penn does it so it's kind of like I, I think it could change, but at this point, I really wouldn't expect it to. Um, there's a lot more leniency around the subject tests because, so I think that you should really prioritize taking the SAT and AC or ACT um, over those and like worry a little bit less of, about those if you don't have two or three at this point and you're a junior. Um, but that said, yeah, I would I'd really not expect a, a push towards test optional from the Ivy Leagues, um, for example. Uh, that said, there are a lot of excellent schools in Boston, like Tufts um, and Boston University that are actually kind of piloting test optional programs. Um, so I think Tufts went test optional for three years. And then BU, I think, is this cycle is test optional. Um, and the AP exams will be honored in terms of the credit policies, um, no matter what your, I mean, kind of as normal. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I would think about the, I, I wouldn't assume that the SAT or the ACT will become suddenly waived everywhere, especially in the Northeast. Okay, so um, which brings me up to my other question about um, some already competitive colleges, like you mentioned BU, um, and then I think Williams, Amherst, they all have gone test optional on a pilot basis. Uh, mm -hmm. And then of course there's some 1200 plus colleges that have been test optional all along, even pre-COVID-19. So 
let's say that we have a junior 2021 um, who hasn't had a chance to take the SAT or ACT and thinking about these piloted, you know, test optional colleges, do you recommend them, you know, skip SAT, ACT and go straight to the application process because most, um, a lot of people are probably going to do the same or do you still say test optional while well, you can still submit SAT, ACT scores and here is why? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think that you, it's a good idea to try to take the SAT or ACT regardless of where you're applying unless you're solely applying to completely test optional schools um, that have been test optional for a long time. So for example, I think there's a big distinction between schools that are like, for example, Bates, I think it's been test optional for like decades and then schools that are piloting test optional this year, um, but are normally used as a metric. Um, I think in the case of um, in the case of like the second group, kind of the ones that are piloting it, it's a, I think it's still a good idea to submit your SAT or ACT as long as it's, it's within that range um, of that middle 50% or higher. So that's, that's something that you should really work towards. Also thinking about um, Okay, we're losing um, Kevin. Let's see uh, if he can come back. Kevin? Okay, we might have lost Kevin for a short period of time here. So uh, I'm going to take on uh, from what he, okay, well, here he is. Kevin? I'm sorry about that. That's okay, yeah, so we can hear you. Great. Go ahead. Um, sorry, what did you, where did so, I So yeah, you're, you're, you're talking about the, you know, you should still be considering to take the SAT, ACT, given that these schools are piloting because they are used to including SAT, ACT as part of their process. So you recommended that and then we lost you. <laughs> okay, um, great. I can say my answer better. Um, basically, so for the ones that are piloting it, um, yeah, I would still, I would still try to take that take the SAT and ACT and score with above that middle 50% or at least within the middle 50% range. Um, for schools like Bates where um, it's test optional and has been for decades and again you want to draw a distinction between test optional versus like not even looking at the tests at all. Um, so that's kind of a there are kind of differences within that and nuances within like the test optional category. Um, yeah, so I think, I think you're going into a question that was submitted before uh, our session here on Facebook. It looks like it reads, some colleges don't even look or want to look at the SAT right. scores. And that term is called test blind. Yes. So there are very, very few, very few test blind schools. You'll see over 1,200, now about 1,300 plus colleges that are test optional, meaning they're going to look at your scores if you submit them and if you want them to be included in the admissions and the merit-based consideration. Um, and if you don't submit them, then they won't. So the question was really, should you go test optional for the schools that have just recently announced that they're going test optional? And I think Kevin made a really strong and an important advice there that said, if the school is a pilot on test optional, then you should at least try to submit one solid SAT, ACT score within the range that that school has already accepted. I think that's really, really uh, solid advice. Um, and which brings me up to my other question about, you know, uh, schools that are truly been test optional, like you said, like Bates, Wake Forest, George Washington, which are kind of like the pioneers of test optional movement. You know, why are they still accepting SAT and ACT as an option anyway. Like it's confusing the parents, it's confusing the students. Um, and what we've seen in the past is if you're applying to a school like George Washington, the average ACT has been like 29 to 32 and it keeps shifting upwards because people who are deciding to submit scores to George Washington, they only submit the higher scores. So it looks like test optional is actually pushing the averages that are being submitted to these test optional schools. So then what's the point? Yeah, no, that's a, I think it, that's a great sort of way of putting it. I think it, it's kind of like half in, but not fully in. So it, it can be very confusing in terms of what they're what they're looking for will I be penalized for not submitting my scores all that stuff versus like test blind where they 
you know, if you're if you send your SAT to those schools, like you're basically wasting your money because they won't look at it. Yeah. So um, for the crowd that you recommended, they should take the SAT or ACT at least once. What are their options given the tests are canceled now? Like, have you heard anything from SAT and ACT in terms of makeup dates? Maybe um, it could be makeup locations or different forms of offering these tests to the students. Okay, so it looks like we've just lost Kevin. Um, my question was about um, the students who have, um, who need to actually take the SAT and ACT, what can they do? So what we know, at least for now, is that the ACT has been um, planning to, okay, Kevin is back. I'm um, so sorry about that. that that's okay, so AC, ACT has been planning to make an a, um, online at home testing for September 2020, even pre COVID-19. And what they have done is they have speed up their um, implementation of this process, hoping to do it by July, even though they haven't promised it, um, they're working on it. So to do an online version, at home version of the ACT by July 18th national testing date. Um, SAT also has just announced that they're designing an at-home SAT uh, because they're the designers of the AP anyway, so they know how to do this. Um, they're, that's also going to be rolled out pretty much uh, by the end of the summer or beginning of fall. So for those students who are looking to, you know, take the SAT and ACT who have been prepping for it, options are coming up as soon as middle of the summer. But of course, um, you know, the, the, the other option is to wait for the test centers to open and actually take them in person, but that, that might take as late as September or October of this year, which might be too late for some students trying to apply early. So Kevin, anything to add for that? Um, yeah, I think that basically, so currently the, S, the SAT is still on for June, but it's looking likely that it'll be online, as you mentioned. Um, I think that a lot of the like a lot of resources for preparation are online as well and i think that thinking about those thinking about maybe getting a tutor at this point online um over zoom for example would be a really good strategy right now because i mean the fact is is that like they will basically as you mentioned again like the ap ap tests are going online they're under the same company the college board also does the sat um so i would really think about it, there will be opportunities to take the SAT in the summer, I think, and it may be online, it may be in a slightly different format, but it's going to fundamentally be there and a lot of colleges are still going to expect that you submit either the SAT or the ACT. So Excellent. And I put up, uh, Kevin, your information from what you know of the from the surrounding uh, colleges that either have still not changed the SAT, ACT requirement or that have kept the same. Do you want to summarize it for us? Yeah. Um, so they're kind of, these are kind of like five, five or six big colleges in Massachusetts. Uh, so Boston College, uh, the current testing requirements for the fall will be in, in play. Um, every college is pretty much going to honor the results of the AP tests, except for UMass is kind of thinking about, it's still thinking about AP credit, but I think they're going to honor it because there's a lot of pressure. That would be my hunch. I'm not going to, don't quote me on that. Um, there, uh, so Boston University is going to go test optional for this next admission cycle, as I mentioned. Um, basically, Tufts is kind of doing the same, but for three years. Um, all, all schools are going to be pretty much lenient on the past fill grades, really, for spring 2020. That's, that's a common theme throughout, and there's um, especially like because students don't have control over that in the slightest, especially if they're, you know, if they're, if the administrators at their school make the decision to go pass fail. Um, so again, you can kind of take the measures we've discussed to really um, illuminate how you did in those classes. But otherwise, um, I would say definitely prioritize taking the SAT or ACT over taking that last subject test or something like that, because that's going to be much more important especially in this context. And even Harvard said that they do, they do expect students to take the SAT or ACT, but they recognize it might only be once. Um, there's no like penalty for not submitting subject tests, and that's something we reiterate. Um, and again, I think that's pretty much, that's pretty much the summary. Um, okay. Another thing about like these really top schools is with the AP credit. Um, they're actually not that, 
they're going to give you a lot less AP credit. Like MIT, like there are a few, like they might give you credit for a few fives, but like that's pretty much it. So, but that's been historically true anyway. It's not exactly just now. right. Yeah. Right. right. So that's been, that's been historically true. Um, so it honestly, like the AP tests going online and sort of how you do is obviously, you know, it's great to get that five or, mm -hmm. you know, do as well as you can, but it's, it's going to be kind of even less important from Makes like sense. an elite college credit perspective. And one thing to note about uh, Kevin's comment about the SAT, ACT at least once on the case of Harvard is that Harvard even knows that you, you know, many students who are submitting those top 99th percentile or higher scores have taken the test multiple times, even if they submit only one score. So they are going to be more flexible, but that doesn't mean, you know, they're going to give you an easier pass. Um, if you've taken the test once and have a 34 ACT rather than your normally would get a 36 after two or three tries, they may take that into consideration in context of everything else in the factors of admissions that, that we talked about, but still, you know, need to focus on taking it if you're considering competitive colleges, even if they may have gone test optional in a pilot way. So now my next question to Kevin goes about the seniors, seniors who are about to make a choice for their college admissions and the deadline is May 1 for, you know, many of them, but then some 340 plus colleges now have pushed back their deadlines to June 1 or later. So some of those colleges in your region are listed on the, you know, on the screen there. So what does this mean for the students? Does that mean that, you know, they can truly wait till June 1st to make their decision? And if so, what can make their decision easier given that they cannot visit these colleges? Yeah, it's definitely a, a difficult kind of part of this. And it's an uneven thing at this point, because as you can see, a lot of colleges have kept their deadline at June 1st. Um, and, or, made, sorry, made, move, made sorry move, moved, yeah. uh, moved to June 1st. Um, mm -hmm. And, but the, the thing about it is a lot of the more competitive colleges have stayed at May 1st, especially, and it's not, at this point, it's still kind of a, a minority movement. I think there will be, it could be that some do push their deadline back, but um, they may not, like, I think it's the ones that are currently doing it, like, there isn't a lot of time to, like, push it back to June 1st at this point. That said, um, you, families, if they need more time or are kind of weighing offers, First of all, they should check whatever deadlines, like whatever schools they're admitted to, their student is admitted to, like when those deadlines are and whether they've been pushed back from May 1st to June 1st. Um, and if they need more time or they need to like talk more about financial aid or make decisions, um, they should definitely contact their admissions office. And I think that especially, you know, in light of the recent circumstances, they're going to be pretty lenient about maybe granting extensions or figuring out, um, you know, a special arrangement for those families. So um, I think that that's a really solid advice given that uh, some, most schools still stayed May 1, but then they cannot make the decision by May 1. You're suggesting they can still do that if they, you contact them at first, is that right? Yeah, I think just being proactive and contacting the admissions office. Um, the same is true with financial aid if your situation has changed. Um, don't fill out FAFSA, FAFSA or CSS again. Uh, get in contact with your admissions office or the, uh, sorry, the financial aid office um, and think about, you know, like really try to document any major changes in your ability to pay. Um, so that, that's kind of another thing, just being proactive, taking that time to connect with um, representatives at the universities and whatever service you need. Um, in terms of, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so yeah, in fact, I, I was just gonna ask about the, you know, how to help make the choice easier given that students cannot visit these colleges, you know, e seniors or even younger ages. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, the first thing is that obviously it's gonna make it more challenging. There's not, uh, you know, not a way to get around that really because you can't physically see it. Are uh, you, you know, in a lot of cases, but uh, the good news is that there are a lot more virtual options. Um, there are many more tours that are being offered online, sometimes even like informal chats with students, student representatives and faculty members and things like that that are being offered by colleges. So you want to do, you want to really um, look into that as much as you can. There are also, there's a website, is it College Real? Or, uh, campusreal.org, R-E. Campusreal.org. It's one of the um, virtual visit um, website. And then the other one is uvisit.com. 
Right. So those are great resources. Um, the other thing I would do is really look at like the newspapers for every school um, and think about like the, the student newspapers and look at like how kind of perspectives on like what's going on on campus, like how the community is holding up, maybe not on campus, but like how the campus is reacted to the circumstances and like what's going on kind of internally. Um, good advice I heard recently was just like, think about the, really look at the options. And especially if you're doing research, not only for seniors, but for juniors and sophomores, um, if you're doing research on schools, think about the things that aren't really intended for them. Like look into like the, the things that aren't coming from the college admissions office, you know, like the sort of getting that real scoop from like the talking to individual students who aren't maybe tour guides or uh, looking at college newspapers, kind of other things that are meant for current students, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Thank you. So those are advices for, for, the, for the seniors. Now, we also have ninth, 10th, and 11th graders who are kind of shaping up their college list or finalizing their college list. One of the factors of college admissions is obviously to demonstrate interest to the college that, that you're, you're thinking about so that they can you know, consider that as part of their application process. They cannot visit right now. So how are they going to be able to demonstrate interest to the college uh, by visiting virtually? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so a lot of the virtual tours are actually fairly formal. You have to register for them and kind of, it'll, your attendance kind of at them will be tracked. So in that sense, colleges will actually keep track of those metrics, whether you've registered and attended. And that's a way of actually demonstrating interest kind of from afar. The same thing is true, like to an extent, if you open emails from colleges um, and really read them, like that sort of, that's kind of a new, relatively new thing, but something that uh, is a good way of demonstrating interest and also learning more about the colleges, obviously, as well. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. And uh, we got about eight minutes. So what we're gonna, what I'm gonna do is go to the Q and A. So we have sure. some coming through Facebook. So I'm looking at like two different screens here. So bear with me. But uh, one of the questions coming through is asking about the competitive colleges in your region specifically, knowing that you're surrounded by Harvards and MITs. Um, would college admissions to these particular universities be any easier post COVID nineteen, given the trends given maybe the demographics even you know like given that maybe international students are not going to be as much participating into applying to these colleges because they're scared and they want to stay home out of staters maybe staying back as well do you see harvard mit these guys at, at all like you know uh, increasing their admissions rates because the numbers are down um i think it's possible but i wouldn't I wouldn't bank on that at all. And I think that's one of the factors that, you know, you can't really control who else applies. So I would say that like, it's not out of the question that maybe they get a little, a slightly smaller applicant pool, but at the same time, like there are other things like students might defer, you know, and then take up spots in next year's class or something like that. So there's kind of, there are a lot of factors to weigh. So I, I don't necessarily think I can give you a definitive answer. Maybe and and, she, like and here's, here's why this particular person is asking that question. She read an article on Wall Street Journal and- Oh, Forbes. that's your favorite uh, article. Yeah, my favorite article personally <laughs> that I have uh, fought very hard to take down by Forbes, which I succeeded. I couldn't succeed on the Wall Street Journal one. Um, but people are reading these news and they're seeing that these uh, newsworthy articles uh, pretty much say, you know what, you can apply to Harvard and probably have a higher chance of getting in next year. So, but what you're saying is you, it's kind of out of your control. I think it's out of your control and probably not the best way to look at it either. Uh, it's, it, you know, I mean, it's a national crisis and an international crisis. I think that like thinking about, you know, maybe, maybe a few percentage points higher at most is like, you know, getting that admissions advantage. I think that that's not gonna, you know, that's, that's really not going to, um, not the best way to think about it. I also think that, you know, the schools won't, aren't gonna change their standards really. I think that, you know, we've talked about how, you know, Harvard expects you, they, they're gonna like probably let you take, they'll be more accepting about like that one SAT or submitting that one ACT score, but you know, that, that SAT or ACT has to be really good. So like, I mean, it's kind of like the fewer metrics you have, like that's true across the board or the fewer quantitative metrics, but you know, the, the flip side is like, they might expect 
higher quality essays or things that like higher quality recommendation letters even than normal because you know you have so much time at home and hopefully like you, you are attending those sessions you are kind of figuring out where you want to go and really like doing your research on each institution so that's actually another question that came through on Facebook is asking about the test optional schools specifically if you don't submit test scores um, what factors we just talked about that you should be putting more weight into um, I guess you know it's more college specific of course but you know what would you recommend in terms of what factors to kind of put more weight into yeah um, so I mean if you think about the seven factors like they're all going to be there to an extent but you know, as the, for example, like if your GPA is like slightly minimized by, you know, the pass fail situation, and then like, you're not submitting all the testing that you normally would, I think the essays and the rec letters grow in importance as well. Um, the other thing is like extracurriculars, um, you may have to get more creative. One thing that like, and leadership is still going to be really important. But one thing that I heard someone say, um, on one of the webinars I attended, actually, I think she was like the Dean of Admissions at Emory, so she knows what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but she basically said that like leadership doesn't have to be a title, which I think is important. Um, so it can be doing stuff like helping your classmates, you know, online. Um, really can and kind of like, yeah, just like making the most of the situation and being productive. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the essays and especially the research on the institutions and the moments of like the self reflection, I think is going to be something to really emphasize and really do kind of in this time. That makes sense. So any, um, I guess, words of wisdom you have for our we viewers for what, you know, uh, about what we talked about in general and what you would advise them to do or not do. Yeah, that's a, that's good. Um, I mean, I think the first thing is like to stay safe and make sure that you're okay and your family's okay and you're in a good headspace. Um, I think that creating a schedule and really trying to stick to it every day has helped me a lot personally um, and taking days to like, you know, taking days off, even if I'm at home and like making like working days and off days. Um, that's been really good, staying connected socially. I think that, yeah, just taking advantage of kind of all these online platforms. And I think that really, preparing for opportunities to come back and kind of return to more normal circumstances is going to be, um, you know, is kind of paramount. There are a lot of things that we can't control right now, which is tough, um, but there are, you know, you can kind of control what you do every day or you can control what you do every day and sort of the, the preparation, the engagement in classes, um, the research, thinking about essays. So there, there are tons of things that you can kind of still control. Um, and then just like the final thing is like paying attention to the news and checking, especially like in your specific context, like the, um, with the high schools, like what your, you know, what your situation is, like if they're going to open again, you know, or checking whatever state you're in, um, deposit deadlines for the colleges like that. If you're a senior, like what, you know, what those are and like thinking about those decisions and just being proactive and contacting the admissions office and the financial aid office if you need to. Thank you very much, Kevin, and thanks for joining us today. Um, so everyone, thanks for joining us today. And um, we're almost out of time here. I'd like to put, put our contact information on there. We're very social, uh, active on social media. Kevin and I are both very active. We give you the news as they happen on Twitter, especially, but you can follow us on LinkedIn as well. And we have more free webinars coming up next week, uh, starting with is test optional really optional? Which is going to be a session on Monday at 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, so please join us. I know that's a big topic right now. And we have another one on Thursday of next week. It's going to be, is the pass-fail system going to pass me or fail me in college admissions? Again, that's another big topic that we're going to be talking about. So please join us. It's on fraudeducation.com forward slash free webinars. Sign up and we will see you soon. Stay healthy. Have a great weekend and um, holy weekend um, at home with your loved ones. Thank you and have a good day. take care. Bye.